Welcome to the Global Health Insights Podcast at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. I'm Pauline Chu in Media Relations. Thank you for joining us. In this podcast, we're going to be diving into health disparities across the United States at a county by county level and how the research is done going into this. Dr. Ali Mukdad, Professor of Health Metric Sciences at IHME and Chief Strategy Officer of Population Health is joining us, as well as Dr. Laura Dwyer Lindgren, an Assistant Professor of Health Metric Science at IHME, and she also leads the U.S. Health disparities team. So thank you both for being with us. And let's start with the exciting news, which is IHME has been awarded a major contract with the NIH. Uh, Dr. Mukhtad, do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? No, we're so excited and we're looking forward to this collaboration with NIH. Uh, this builds on previous work that we have done with them for the past three years, and now they extended it for another five years. And we're looking at disparities in health outcomes, burden of disease at the county level by race ethnicity uh, from 1990 all the way now. That's what GBD does. For this part of work, we're trying to go back as much as we can, and we are right now going back till uh, 2000. And we're looking at trends and what's changing here. What are the areas that have more disparities in health by race, ethnicity across the United States? Dr. Dwyer Lindgren, take us a little deeper into the picture of health disparities in marginalized communities in the U.S. Sure. So um, there are all kinds of health disparities in the U.S. So if we focus, for example, on disparities in life expectancy, disparities on how long people live, um, there are gigantic racial and ethnic disparities in life expectancy. So um, people who are Black, people who are American Indian or Alaska Native live multiple years less um, than people who are white on average. And then similarly, people who are Asian, people who are Latino tend to live longer, although there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, there are also really substantial spatial uh, differences, so differences among different regions, different states, different counties uh, in the U.S. And, and there we're talking about multi-decade differences um, in life expectancy among different counties. And when you look at those two dimensions simultaneously, so you look at how, um, for example, uh, Black people in one county and Asian people in another county, um, how long they live, the, the disparities are even bigger. You know, you just see, again, multiple decades of differences in life expectancy. Um, and for some of the work that we've done so far on uh, causes of death, so what are people dying from? One of the kind of interesting things that we find is that um, those disparities are essentially ubiquitous. So we, the exact pattern definitely varies, um, but we see racial and ethnic disparities across effectively all causes of death. We see spatial disparities across effectively all causes of death. Um, and this is true over time. And in some cases, those disparities are getting worse. There were some cases where the disparities were getting better over the course of the, the two decades that we looked at, but we also know that in the context of COVID, a lot of that has been reversed. So it'll be interesting to see how that compares once we add in uh, the effects of COVID as well. Yeah, we know COVID magnified some of those disparities in a big way. And Dr. Dwyer Lindgren, you've been part of this um, for several years. And as Dr. Muktada had mentioned, uh, you've looked at that time range from 2000 to 2019. And as we look at the research that's going to happen for the next five years, you're going to add years to, to that. And what else will you specifically be researching? Yeah, so we're going to add years. We focused, um, as you said, on that, that what I'm now thinking of is the two decades before COVID, although that's not how we framed it originally. Um, and obviously, we want to start updating that to the last few years, and so many things have changed. Um, in the first three years, we also focused not exclusively, but primarily on what we think of as fatal outcomes. So how long do people live? What are the disparities in longevity, um, both among counties and among racial ethnic groups? Uh, and also, what are people dying of? Um, and in the next five years, we want to expand into other aspects of health. So. Um, what do people suffer from uh, while they are alive? What decreases their health? What causes ill health? Um, so looking at prevalence and incidence of a lot of different conditions. And then we also want to expand our work on uh, risk factors. So things that we know lead to um, ill health and early death. Another thing that we are looking to expand is um, for a variety of kind of 
data challenge reasons. Um, the race and ethnicity groups that we've been using so far uh, are aligned with sort of older guidance around how to report on race and ethnicity. Um, so, for example, we are currently using a combined Asian uh, and Native Point or other Pacific Islander group, which is really no longer the standard. Um, so part of our uh, efforts kind of in the future are going to be to do the um, very large amount of work required to split those two groups and also to add a new group for uh, individuals who are multiracial. So that's very important because in the United States, we're becoming more and more of a multiracial, multi-ethnic society. So it's difficult to just check one box anymore. And so this is very important research. Uh, but how exactly are you getting the data? Uh, this is county by county. You, uh, you're looking at health risks, mortality, death rates. Uh, now you're you're also going to be looking at risk factors. I mean, that's the treasure trove of information. So where exactly are you getting all of this from? There's a couple of sort of key places that we get data from. So when it comes to data just on how many people are there, which is like the most fundamental thing you can do in terms of starting to think about health, most of that data comes from the decennial census, which happens every 10 years, and then something called the American Community Survey, which is an ongoing approximately 1% sample of the U.S. population. So that's where all uh, kind of our basic information about, you know, what are where are people living, what is their identity um, comes from. And then in terms of health outcomes for mortality or fatal outcomes uh, that I mentioned earlier, that information is coming primarily from death certificates. So when somebody dies, they have a death certificate that's filled up, that's aggregated at the state level. States submit that data to the federal government, gets compiled, and then we use that kind of compiled data set um, that represents all deaths that occur in the U.S. So that's actually reasonably straightforward. Um, when it comes to estimating uh, non-fatal outcomes, so things, again, that kind of affect people while they're still alive and cause ill health, it's much more varied. So we pull from a number of different sources there. Um, in some cases, we can use uh, health surveys. So, you know, you'll have a survey where somebody either shows up at your house or calls you and asks you questions that would include things like, have you ever been diagnosed with diabetes um, that tell you something about uh, how common the condition is? Um, we can also leverage certain types of data that come out of clinical encounters, right? So like claims data, um, which are relatively common, or hospitalization data, um, or other types of information that are generated by the healthcare system. Um, we're looking into kind of what other data sources there are. We spent a lot of time in the first three years thinking about, okay, among the data sources that we already know exist um, as part of the DVD, what are the ones that have county detail? Because that's what we need for this analysis and also have information on race and ethnicity. And I think going forward, we have to think um, even more broadly too about how do we kind of draw in every potential source of information to really do a good job at this at such a fine level of detail. And Dr. Mukta, this is such a huge amount of data. We've already looked at more than 3,000 counties, and you're going to be continuing with that for the next five years. Um, and you're getting very granular at that county level. How do you expect all of this rich data to be used? So uh, I need to clarify one thing. We're working with NIH and different institute, but the main uh, institute we're working with on this project is the National. National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities uh, at NIH. So they're leading that. And we have a close relationship working with them. Uh, when we uh, at IHME, we're uh, kind of built an expertise in looking at different sources of data and putting it together in order to get a better picture of health. And we strongly feel if you can't measure an outcome, you cannot improve it. And that's very important for us to get it correct. And all that data coming to us at IHME and we're putting it together in order to get a better picture of health is showing a lot of disparities in the U.S. between different racial groups. And in many instances, the improvement from 2000 to 2019 did not occur or occurred in the first 10 years, but slowed down in the last 10 years. For Native Americans, for, ex for example, we haven't seen any improvement at the national level at uh, for life expectancy and when you look at the disparities between racial group and between geography and racial ethnic group you have people here in the united states that live more than anybody else on the planet and we have people here in the united states with a life expectancy that's ranked among the lowest countries in the world 
huge disparities in the US for a country with our might and our ability to spend money and deal with problems that's not ac ac acceptable. What we hope with this data and with this amount of data provided to everybody, not only for our colleagues at NIH, but for states, for counties, and for other uh, people who are working on health, health organization, is basically to point where is the need for interventions. And the fact we are doing this on a continuous basis at IHME, it allows you also to look and see what kind of impact you are doing if you do it right. Because we can, we're going to repeat it. So this is a baseline from 2000 all the way till now. If there are programs to deal with such risk factors or with such diseases in the United States, what will happen? And the fact that we keep repeating this at IHME will allow you to look at it and evaluate your program. Are you doing the right thing in order to improve health. The bottom line here is we want to provide the best data for decision maker in order to build on it policies and program and implement them at the local level to improve health. All right. And that was a key question that you posed earlier. Where is the need for intervention? And that's where um, decision makers and leaders and, and public, the public who's concerned, can really start thinking about this as they look at the data. Um, Dr. Dwyer Lindgren, as you look ahead for this exciting extension of the partnership and, and really drilling down deeper, what do you see as some of the challenges as, as a research scientist um, going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of um, just sort of technical challenges with doing this. So, you know, I alluded to earlier that we have done a lot of work on fatal outcomes, and in part that's because the data are comparatively straightforward. Um, it wouldn't say easy to work with because they're not, but they're comparatively straightforward. You have, have information on all these different causes. You have it comprehensively across location, across time. Um, so it, it at least is all kind of there. And once we move into trying to consider non-fatal health outcomes, especially trying to do so in a really comprehensive kind of way, the data get a lot trickier. So you have to deal with a lot more, oh, there just isn't data in every year, there isn't data in every location, or here's a data source that maybe has some detail by race and ethnicity, but not the kind of detail that matches with the groups that we're actually trying to analyze. So there's a lot more work that needs to be done to figure out how to leverage what information does exist in those data sources, even though it's not kind of in the preferred format that matches up exactly with the dimensions of our analysis. So I think that's a big challenge. Um, I think the other challenge just kind of generally for this type of work is that, you know, we're doing these analyses by race and ethnicity because we want to be able to really illuminate racial and ethnic disparities that exist in the U.S. in a very detailed way. Um, but race in particular is a social construct and the way that people understand it changes over time. Um, you know, part of the reason why there are more multiracial individuals in the U.S. is because more people identify as multiracial who didn't previously identify it that way. So I think there's some interpretation challenges as well around what does this mean and what population does this refer to and to what extent are the trends that we're seeing um, in part because these populations are changed uh, over time. So I think there's sort of that aspect of this. Dr. Mukhtar, do you have anything to add in terms of looking ahead and what some challenges might be? I'd like, I, I don't like to frame it as challenges. I mean, uh, we have a lot of challenges in the United States. We can keep talking about it, but I'd like to look at the opportunities ahead. As you know, the global burden of disease, we have about 370 diseases that we monitor and about 84 risk factors that we provide data on. Because of the sample size here, we're working at the county by race ethnic group. We will not be able to do a full global burden of disease. So we'll have a limited set of diseases that we will be able to monitor from 2000 till now at the, at the local level. So that wealth of information that will be available in the United States will create a lot of opportunities. So take, for example, if you provide data for cardiovascular disease or we provide data for cancer, there are different group here who need such data in order to act upon it. American Heart Association would love this data for heart disease in order to know and where to invest, where to plan cancer. So it's very important for us to increase our uh, access to the data, which will make it available for everybody, but to explain how we did it and to make sure people are using it and they own it. We want at the end of the day that the ownership become at the county level, at the state level, at the decision maker level. And we are here providing a support role in order to make sure that data can maximize impact. 
This is exciting news, and thank you so much for your important work, Dr. Ali Mokdad and Dr. Laura Dwyer-Lindgren. It was great speaking with both of you. Thank you. 